<laughs> All right, there we go. What is this, a uh, middle school basketball game? What, what? And we are live. Hey, guys, what's going on? This is Caliber Corner, episode number 46. We have a awesome group of uh, viewer-suggested topics for you today. We've got hunting rifles, pocket carry, yes or no, and getting into competitive shooting, competitive shooting 101. So we'll talk about a lot of the different uh, organizations that are out there. Uh, before we do anything, let's go ahead and take attendance and see who's with us. Not a lot of people out there right now because I think that uh, it's a little bit early. A lot of people had a had a long night. Uh, I know a lot of you Gun Channels guys were up late burning the midnight oil. So right now we've got uh, Midnight Range out there, and we've got Victor Cordovez is with us. Yeah, I'm over there on the uh, YouTube side. Let's do a quick little refresh on the Gun Channel side to see what we got. We got Paper Plane Crash out there right now. We got Ohio 45 ACP. And Tony York is there and here. And let's go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves. Guys, feel free to, to put a plug in for your channels, your shows, just what you're doing right now. So let's go ahead and start off on my right. Uh, Tony, what is new in your world, brother? Mm, not a hell of a lot. I think we are finally moved the early watch to start at about 7 a.m. Central. Yeah. Which suits me. Uh, and I think we're only going to run about an hour a day. So just Monday through Friday, or what are we looking at? Yes. Monday okay. through Friday. All right. And there will probably be a day off each week. It okay. just seems to work out that way. Okay. No, it is good. Make sure you check out the early watch over on gunchannels.com. Uh, and, you know, every day you guys have something different that you bring to the program, which is really cool. It's a good one just to put on in the mornings, just to play it. Even if you don't get to check it out live, go back and listen to it later. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite programs. It's what got me into gun community, gun culture, uh, podcasts, and, and gun media and fun stuff like that. So do check it out. So, Tony, I thank you for joining us this morning. I think you'll like the topics that we have. Uh, Texas uh, Nurse, what's going on, man? Texas Nurse, what's up, buddy? Sorry. Yeah, wasn't quick on the draw on the, uh, on no, the no, microphone. No, no, we're we're okay, I'm, doing, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Cool, cool. I want to welcome you back to the show. I know you've been a busy man lately, and you got a lot of new stuff going on in your life. So, yeah. Uh, hey, it's going to be awesome, man. It's good to have you with us. Yeah, looking right. forward to it. Heck yeah, man. All right. Squib, what is new in your world, bro? Good morning, all. Uh, it's a drizzly Michigan morning, and uh, happy to be on the show. Thanks for the invite. Cool, cool. Do you have any shows that you want to uh, go ahead and let us know that we should be checking out and uh, anything you'd like to plug at this time? Oh, uh, yeah, pretty much all of them, because I'm weaseling on to everybody's show these days. Uh, <laughs> Mondays, Mondays, I'm doing lock and load. Sometimes uh, Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock, I'll weasel on to hit or miss. Uh, yeah. Wednesdays, uh, Rick's, uh, Rick uh, does his Shooting with Disability show at 7 mm -hmm. Eastern. Mm -hmm. uh, Thursday, uh, I was... Oh, boy, I'm kind of bouncing around on Thursdays. Um, uh, there's a couple different shows, actually, um, and and uh, some of the times keep changing. I know Jelsma just changed. Uh, his Sunday show is now on at 10 p.m. on Thursdays. I, yeah, I think that's how he, he redid it. He's got, a, he's got Friday, several shows during the week, which are which are awesome to check out. I know he kind of changed his lineup and his programs and stuff, yeah. so you check now out his channel. Doing, yeah. He's doing, I think, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I was teasing him last night. I said, what are you trying to catch up the clover? So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, you, you can pretty much fill your schedule with a couple programs every night if you want to. I still think we need a live 24-7 channel over on Roku. Gun channels, the channel. <laughs> yeah. The gun, the gun channels yeah. channel. That would just be well, awesome. Or, or just do gun channels 1, 2, and 3, kind of like BBC, BBC 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> and, yeah, and just, you know. If you want to. Uh, and then uh, Fridays. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Fridays is a busy night. Uh, if if everybody's on, that's just it. Friday is is the night of the week where you, uh, you may or may not see have that that regular show on. Uh, Budget Guns and Gear starts at seven, yeah. and yeah. then by by eleven thirty at night, Edge of the Week is on, and uh, sometimes there's uh, up to four shows that I weasel my way on to on a Friday. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm all over. I don't do a show on my own. Uh, I just uh, weasel on other people's shows like this one. Thanks, Travis. 
Hey, man. You've been with us for over a year now, so I appreciate you showing up every week and getting up early and, and staying with us even through all those uh, sports tournaments you got to go to in the mornings and stuff. You stay with us. So I do appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's not my son's flag football game you hear in the background. Those are all of my fans cheering. Yeah, that's your fan club, man. That's your fan club. <laughs> oh, man. Sometimes you got to have the cheerleaders, you know, give me an A. Or, I'm sorry, give me an S, give me a Q, give me a U, give me an I, give me a B. That kind of thing. You know, that'd be awesome to have that going on in the background. That's how we know it's going to be a real fan club, man. We got the cheerleaders cheering for you. So, I feel like right. I need to put on some boots. Why is that, Tony? Well, you know, uh, Rubber boots are boots with uh, gaiters to protect you from snake bites. Because we were talking about that last night. <laughs> rubber boots. You guys had a boot, a boot and car discussion for hours, man. That is just awesome. I don't know how. I guess you know. Yeah. What if the car? Does, the car discussion was my fault. That's all right. That's all right. I was trying to to fill in squib on on the cars that you like and why you like the cars that you like and, and what some of those cars are. Oh, but man, he said it was a good chat. Cars. So yeah, it was right great. On. All right, man. So, Squib, you're a busy man. So, thank you for joining us today. I do appreciate your time. All right, moving over. Sandhill Shooter, what is up, bro? What's new in your world, man? Oh, not a whole lot is new since last time we talked. I do have a Patreon page started. Okay. But I don't have anything up on it yet, so there's really no need to have people go over there and check it out yet. But um, I suppose if I have a few patrons, that would uh, be incentive for me to make it worth their while. So, I guess if anybody wants to go over there and check it out, I will get some stuff up today if I can get five of us supporters. I think your motto would be on this channel. If you want to put the link over there on the, the chat on the YouTube side and the gun channel side, that'll get you going. Is it oh. patreon.com backslash Sandhill Shooter? I'm just guessing. Yeah. Is that what it is? Exactly what it is. All right, cool, cool. All right, cool. And you know, that that kind of stuff, a lot of people think, oh, you're just, you're just e-bagging this and that. When you run gun channels, especially if you want to start doing things like rage tests or you want to start doing uh tabletop reviews and stuff it's not cheap to get into and i mean like i said this is my only hobby that i really you know spend the majority of my disposable income for, for on because i love it but it's not inexpensive you know you go out and do a range test it's amazing how much it costs just to bring that one range test to the youtube screen it doesn't have to be expensive but if you want to you know if you want to want to make it a good a good quality video um there, there are some expenses involved in it and that's just part of it is patreon support helps offset those costs so it is nice to have all right so dude i thank you for joining us i know you said at some point you have to jet out but we'll get into the topic of hunting rifles here in just a minute because i know that you have a lot of experience with that i do a lot of us on the pot a lot of us on the panel do too so we'll get that going all right and uh last and certainly but not least we've got awag awag wide thousand what is new in your world bro uh, nothing much oddly enough i am looking for a hunting rifle so oh, um, you've come to the right car lot yeah yeah <laughs> It's it is like it is just like car shopping. So you know what? I'm gonna go back again over to the uh, the YouTube side. We looked on the gun channel side. We still have the same crew that's with us on the YouTube side. We've got some of these uh, these latecomers to the show. So we're gonna go ahead and give them some recognition. Uh, Patrick is with us. David Bowling is out there. Rich White is with us. Uh, Fiddle Newbie is with us. Garage Guns, Moo Butt, Scott P79, Tacos and French Fries. Thanks, bro. Now I'm hungry. Uh, Jeff XL 12 is with us. WB Frank Hellman is joining us. Good morning, Frank. And uh, back to the crew that I mentioned earlier, Midnight Range TM and Victor. So guys, uh, oh, 651 Gunnies just joining in. Good morning, sir. Uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, start the discussion. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody or anything. So we'll do this. So when it comes to purchasing, what it was is the, the question that was asked. It was a, these are viewer requests, by the way. That's why we got such a mishmash of topics every week. E-Rock is here. Good morning, E-Rock. Good to see you, bro. And Trigger Tickler, um, the person said, would you please have a discussion on choosing a hunting rifle? So that's a very broad question because there's three things you need to ask yourself if you're in the market for a hunting rifle. And I think sometimes these are things that, that we should do. We don't always do when we're in the market for a rifle. Let's get these three ideas out here and then you guys can go ahead and fill in however you want. Uh, first of all, the question is, what do you want to hunt? What is it that you're going after? Just don't go buy that 308 or that 30-06 because it's a good deal. You need to ask yourself, what is it that you want to hunt? Do you want to hunt a variety of game? Are you going to go after big game? Or are you going to go after squirrels? Now, as much fun as it sounds to go after squirrels with a 30 out 6 that might be kind of a pricey uh, proposition, and it may be uh, illegal. Some might consider it unethical. So, you know, you want to make sure you're getting the right caliber for whatever you're going after. Now, the next question is, what are you allowed to hunt with? You might be in a state that allows you to hunt deer with an SKS. You might be in a state that only allows bolt-action hunting or slug hunting with 
uh, with deer season. Okay, so you got to know what is it that you're allowed to hunt with. So make sure that you know your local laws. And I mean, most of us responsible gun owners, most of us that are that are into the gun culture and the idea of the gun community, we do those kinds of things. We educate ourselves before we go out and make a purchase sometimes. Uh, and then the last question you got to ask yourself is how much are you willing to spend? What's great about gun companies now is, is your major companies, you know, Remington, uh, Winchester, Savage, Mossberg, these companies all offer entry level rifles where you don't have to break the bank to get into it, but they also offer different tiers and different price points where you get into more features. So you can get yourself a good hunting rifle and, and get into it, say, for, for $300, $350, or you can spend whatever your bank limit is, whatever your, your finances allow, right? So, so we have that. Obviously, the first thing I'm going to say is shop locally, check out your gun shows, check out your pawn shops. You can probably find yourself a good deal if you go there. Now, I'm just going to turn this over to the panel. What is it that you guys look for when you're in the market for a hunting rifle? You guys can just have at it. Well, what I'm trying to look for is a rifle that um, I eventually want to go elk hunting. Um, so something that can take down an elk. And since I'm in the long range shooting now, granted, I know it's very unethical to basically go after an animal past, what, 300 yards? Depending on the caliber, depends on what you're shooting. I mean, if you're, you got the right, I don't say big bore rifle caliber, 338 Lapua, you can go past 300 yards. But, hmm. you know, we're talking deer, elk. You know, yeah, there might be terrain yeah. that, that dictates that you have to take that long-range shot, so just make sure you've got the right hardware for that long-range shot. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. ethics really isn't an issue. So, uh, yeah, that 338, that'll, that'll do it. Especially if you've got experience with long-range shooting and you know how to dope wind and things like that, then it's not a question of if you can hit the target. The question becomes, does the bullet have enough energy for an ethical kill with only one shot? So, yeah, make sure you bring enough gun. But if you know what you're doing and you're confident, then shooting over 300 yards is not unethical. Okay. Yeah, you know, you want to know the ballistics of the round that you're shooting. Is it going to deliver the correct amount of energy that you're required to have at that range for that game that you're hunting? I mean, that's another thing to consider, too, as many times in the state – that you hunt in. I know Alaska gets very, very specific about what you can hunt, how you hunt it, what you can hunt with, the ballistic energy required to drop that animal. That can also have a big influence over what you're looking at too. For ammo is another big is another big consideration when you're out I, there. Uh, I would like to chime in here with mm -hmm. one little point. When you are out there thinking about the range you're going to shoot this animal, just remember you got to drag that sucker back too. Normally I wouldn't hunt alone, so that necessarily wouldn't be an issue but at the same time i understand where you're coming from well you know, you know tony i was yeah. actually thinking the same thing and my body actually started to ache as i thought about it <laughs> yeah i think we've all been to that spot where you've had to drag that deer back uh 300 yards over not so fun terrain because you know it was the end and it's getting dark or it's early morning i mean it's yeah always take that into consideration if you can have an atv to bring it back or a cart to bring it back on or pick up to put it in whatever uh you know yeah i've been in that situation where we've had to drag back drag back a, a big buck at 300 yards and it sucked it was not fun i mean it was yeah yeah i don't even want to go there i'm still feeling it <laughs> um and again another guy hey we had another nice we had another good uh chime in over here on the on the youtube side check out you know 30 30 lever action so we're not going to just talk about bolt action we're talking about lever actions we're talking about bolt actions we're talking about semi autos Real quick, if you want good deals on bolt action rifles, Gelsman had a good point. Uh, you know, Walmart, they do a lot of rollback on their rifles. When it's the end of the hunting season, when spring rolls around, my Walmart will, will clearance out rifles and you can get yourself a nice setup for 275 bucks. He was mentioning something for 260. So again, I don't always want to focus just on the budget thing, but if you're looking for the rifle, go check out your local Walmart. Um, you know, the main thing is that you do some investigating into that model. Uh, so how much research do you guys really do before you buy the rifle? Do you just handle it in the store, dry fire it a couple times? Do you do any, do you watch any videos online? Do you guys read any reviews, magazine articles? What do you guys do when it comes to researching that next rifle that you're going to buy? Uh, I have had enough experience that I don't do a heck of a lot of research. I know what I want usually mm -hmm. when I go. Uh, my main hunting rifle is a uh, Marlin 981-22 because I do more 
squirrel hunting in anything. And when I bought that gun, I was looking specifically for a synthetic stock stainless steel gun that I could swim with. There you go. Uh, oh, that's another one. It's a good point, Tony. Uh, the climate. What are you going to be shooting in? Are you going to be desert? Are you going to be in a in a in a in an area with a lot of moisture? Consider stainless. Do you want a synthetic stock? Do you want to have to maintain a wood stock? I mean, yeah. If you're going to be going through the mud and you're going to be dealing with rain and snow, the finish on the stock or the finish on the gun in general is another huge consideration when you're looking for one. Luckily, most of those models are available. A lot of them are available with a wood stock or synthetics. So you have the options, uh, stainless or blued, right? Now, Tony, there was choose, go ahead, Tony. I would choose laminate over anything right now. Uh, especially center fire because of the weight. Oh yeah, you get like a thirty odd six and synthetic stock. It's going to punish you somewhat with recoil. And it's funny you would mention that the first bolt action hunting rifle that I ever bought when I got into to deer hunting was a uh, Mossberg one hundred. I think it's called an ATR uh, in thirty odd six, and it was not fun to shoot. I mean that sucker man, fifteen or twenty rounds. You were you were feeling it. Like if you go to the range and just play around with it, you're sighting it in and stuff. It was not not a pleasant gun to shoot. Um, just something now, about the, the synthetic, yeah. The the weight issue is a is a two sided coin though too. Yeah. Just like just like with a carry pistol, you know that airweight uh, Smith and Wesson J frame is not fun to shoot when you're practicing, but it's lightweight to carry, and if you actually ever have to use it in a high stress situation, that recoil is not a factor, or you don't feel it as much. And it's the same way when you're hunting. If you've got that featherweight rifle, then yeah, it's going to punish you at the range. And I would recommend maybe a lead sled or something like that, even if it's a lightweight, just a thirty out six, because you're going to thank yourself later. Your shoulder is going to thank you later. But if you're hunting rough country, or if you're elk hunting, you're probably in mountains, and every pound that you can shave off that rifle is a pound you don't have to, you know, hump up a hill. So, and those of us that have hunted animals before. Um, especially, you know, deer and, and bigger things like that, you don't feel that recoil when you're shooting at that deer or at that elk. So it's it's not an issue at that time. And then you're glad that your your rifle is a couple pounds lighter. So I understand and I agree with Tony, if if the if the recoil is an issue, then the heavier the better. Um, but if if it's one of those things where you're planning on carrying a rifle for a week and shooting it one time, then consider that maybe a lightweight rifle is okay as long as you know you you take the proper precautions uh when you practice at the range and make sure you tame that recoil for that or get mm -hmm. yourself in shape and it's not an issue or get yourself in shape and it's not an issue that didn't even occur to me squib but you guys have all <laughs> seen the picture of me so well you know it's just your 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 standard your your standard 20 inch mm -hmm. barrel fixed stock AR-15 is nine pounds, and everybody's trying to build a four-pound AR-15, and it's kind of like, it's five pounds, and, you know, the ounces is pounds, pounds is pain. Okay, when you're going to the shooting range, it's not a big deal, you, from your car to the firing line. Now, yeah, if you're out in the woods, and you're, you're hiking really far into the woods, and that sort of thing, it, okay, sure, but even then... It's still, it's, it's five pounds. I mean, if you're talking about a 25-pound rifle versus a 10-pound rifle, then, yeah, that, that it does add up, especially when you've got other gear and stuff like that. Uh, but if you've got a decent sling and you sling the, the firearm, uh, you know, that's going to take a lot of the weight off because your shoulders are the part of your body that can bear the most load. So if you've got this thing slung, that's going to help. Now, I understand that with a slung rifle, you could get it snagged on stuff walking through certain parts of where you're going to have to hold it with both hands in order to maneuver it through. So I guess it just depends on the type of terrain. But overall, uh, it might be a good excuse for some people to get out and get some exercise, maybe keep a couple, keep a couple dumbbells by the recliner. So while you're watching uh, TV, maybe work your arms a little bit or whatnot and and then you can have the best of both worlds. You can be healthy enough to, to hump that, that heavy rifle through the, through the uh, wilderness to go hunting, but you can also have that heavy rifle to mitigate the recoil. But, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the whole you got the adrenaline rush going when you're, when you're trying to get that, that uh, one clean shot and you're probably not thinking about the recoil at that point. So, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of factors. Everything, everything you guys are saying is absolutely correct, and, and it's, it's – uh, it's it's a lot for somebody to go. Well, which is it? Which do I? You know, what do I want? 
it's another personal preference I would, thing. I would definitely agree with that, though. If, if you're going to be hunting, especially in rough country, <clears throat> or in a climate that's different from where you live if you you know if you live in arizona and you're going to go uh bear hunting in alaska and it's going to be cold then you need to get ready for that and if you're from the flatlands and and you're going to hunt mountains then you need to get used to not just climbing hills but climbing hills where there's no damn air yeah. and that i mean we could have a whole nother discussion about just things that you need to know before you go hunting not just the rifle itself well, what about this though? Um, when you're at the range and you're you're practicing, I mean, some people just go out there, they fire three shots, and they're done, and they're ready to go hunting. Other people, uh, me, uh, have to go out there again and again and again, and and practice and and get better, especially with a new rifle or an un unfamiliar uh, uh, setup. Uh, so, I like that heavier gun to mitigate the recoil, and it just it's for me, it's just more comfortable in general. So this is going to be the, the firearm I choose to take out I, to, to heck with the weight. I, this, is, this is what I want. So I suppose if, if you got a lighter firearm uh, for carrying out in the wilderness, but when you go to the range, you're one of those guys that just walks out there with one box of ammo and, and uh, uh, one target, and you're, you, you can sight it in like that, then I guess it's not, not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because uh, three shots, if you if you have that extra recoil going on your shoulder and maybe bruises you up just a little bit, it's not going to be versus me out there for six hours. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, the definitely. problem with mitigating recoil is, is a gun that's got heavy recoil will cause you to develop a flinch. And... No it can, what. if you practice with it enough, though, I think that you can get yourself used to it. I mean, I used to be like that with my Mosin, just because the way that thing would just pop you. But after you shoot it enough, you expect, you need to practice with it. I mean, yeah, you, I agree, Tony, but with enough practice, I think you might be able to get past that. I mean, that's just my opinion. But The recoil isn't the only thing that will develop a flinch. I, I've been working for years now to get rid of one because I had a rifle, and it was a synthetic stock, but the eye relief wasn't that long on the scope. Mm. And so I had to really choke my face up tight on the comb of the stock to, to get the eye relief. And then since it was a lighter weight rifle, um, it, it bit me a couple times, not enough to cut my eyebrow, but once you get scope bit, then you do develop a flinch unless you are a lot manlier man than I am. Um, and uh, it takes a while to, recognize that you're doing it and force yourself to not move when you pull that trigger because I, oh. I felt myself I started slapping the trigger and all of a sudden I couldn't hit you know I couldn't hit the rod side of a barn and mm -hmm. so taming that recoil is it's not just a matter of you know whether your your uh, your gun is heavy or not or whatever it, there's a lot of factors that go into needing to do that that's why I, I have a lead slit now um, and I can weight that sucker down, and it doesn't matter if I'm shooting, you know, my 243. Um, I still, I still weight it down just to make sure that I'm as accurate as I can be when I'm on the range, and then I don't have to worry about it as much, you know, with that practice. Just like everything else, practice is the key. Just get used well, I to use, it. Use a lead sled to side in too, so you know, I'm with you on that one. Uh, Especially for sighting in, because you want repeatability. Yeah. Once you get the gun dialed into the proper zero, then after that, then you know that if you're missing, it's you. It's not the gun. Then if you're if it's off, you know it's it's your form, it's your trigger pull. You know it's basically you. Or it could be super windy conditions that are causing the drift. But for the most part, you know, yeah. Once you get that zero in, I do want to answer. Have you guys try to answer this question? This is over from the YouTube side. Uh, e Rock said, "Would a 4570 lever action make a decent hunting rifle?" How far would it be good to go? Do you guys have any experience with the 4570 or any suggestions? What's that, Tony? About 150, 200 at the max. Okay. What are we talking about for game on that thing? Somebody said, hey, they were used to hunt buffalo, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Anything that walks planet Earth, probably. Is that, stupid question, but is that overkill for a deer? Is that going to do too much damage to the meat? Is that going to cause too much shock? We're just going to tear it up in the wound area. What's that? Depends on the bullet you use. Okay. 
use a and hard you, cast and just poke a hole straight through him. Yeah. So it would work if you're good out to out to 200 yards. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a good lever action, and it's you know nice all around flexible rifle to have. I uh, have one that's got 26 inch barrel that I would love to be able to hunt with, but because Illinois, I ain't gonna take it out and try to shoot coyotes with the damn thing. <laughs> and that's yeah. about the only thing that we're allowed to hunt is fur bears, and I could take it to the woods and hunt squirrel. That seems to be a little ridiculous, too. <laughs> My grandpa would tell me stories about how they'd sit out on the front porch and shoot prairie dogs with their 30 out sixes. I'm like, are you oh, serious? God. He's like, oh, yeah, it was fun. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I guess yeah, they're farmers. Why there. not? Yeah, the ammo was a lot cheaper well, back then. Yeah, the ammo was cheaper. <laughs> yeah, but still, it's just, you know, it's not like you're going to cook it and eat it later. So yeah, you're, you're just yeah. trying to get, it, uh, get rid of all those holes that they dig. Yeah, this is true, especially in their farmland. You know, that's that was that they their, their farm was right out front of their house. Basically, the land was right out front of the house that they were plowing up. You know, and they, they could buy cases of military surplus ammo for just pennies. Yeah, remember yeah. when you could get the uh, the ball ammo and the armor piercing ammo dirt cheap at the gun shows because it was all leftovers from the fifties, sixties. You know, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah my gun shop uh, used to use a, a crate of. Uh, M, uh, what the hell is M, M2AP, I think. Uh, the armor piercing 30 out 6 stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty stock. sure it's M2, the 30 out 6 armor piercing is M2. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a, they used it as a doorstop at their gun shop because nobody was interested in it at all and they just thought it looked cool. <laughs> I remember going to the gun shows and it was the cheapest stuff you could get. Which today, you know, armor piercing ammunition costs more because it's it's collectible to some extent because uh, everybody shot it up. Uh, but some people still buy it and shoot it. But I got to tell you this: compared to some of the commercial hunting rounds, that stuff shot flatter and more accurate uh, in in both M1 Garand and uh, 03 Springfield. In my experience with it, uh, you know, I was trying different weights and different style bullets. Uh, so out of both rifles and I really, I really like the armor piercing for accuracy, but now it's just, it's like, no, don't shoot it. This is collectible. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a box of 20 here that I have not shot one. I ain't going to shoot one unless I have to stop a charging Ram truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A van. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's the deal, guys. When do you ever take into consideration the fit and the finish on the rifle when you're handling it in the gun store or if you're at the gun show or you're looking to buy it from somebody private? Do you really pay much attention to the finish, the smoothness of the action? Do those things matter to you? Because I'm noticing just a slight decline in quality, especially at the entry level uh, price point, just a little bit rougher finish on the receivers and the bolts. Or is there a brand that tends to make a pretty consistent all around rifle in terms of quality? Uh I'm going to say, for the most part, no, uh, as far as fit and finish goes. Yeah. Uh, the last rifle I acquired was a Browning BL2, and I bought that specifically because of the fit and finish of the gun. Uh, and that's the first I'm gonna time I've say, done that. I'm going to say Henry makes a good quality lever action, both fit and finish, and functionality. And, you know, I, I would never say go support Freedom Group, but I've heard that the Marlin 3030s have improved in quality over the last 10 years since the, the takeover by Freedom Group and the transfer and all that fun stuff. You know, if you get yourself a pre-Freedom Group Marlin 3030, you're going to be in good shape. Don't forget, we also have Howa, we have Tika, and Savage. So, AY, do you have experience with Savage Rifles? Oh, I have tons of experience with Savage Rifles. Okay, so what can you tell us? Because, you know, that's one of the more common models you're going to see. You go to Walmart. They're going to have maybe two or three, maybe four different models from that company what what can you recommend from savage entry level higher end um okay if you want to get a very good platform for hunting i would go with a savage model 10 in 308 it's i mean you can get them dirt cheap um uh not cheaper than dirt but yeah stay away from that website um, yeah yeah you can go anywhere but there <laughs> um but if you maintain a decent relationship with your local gun shop they'll most likely give it 
like sell it to you for a little over what they pay for it so that they make money for it. Um, I picked up a Savage Model 10 FCPSR mm -hmm. for, I think it was like 650 bucks. And tack on a SWFA Super Sniper Scope, which I cannot drive home enough that I love those scopes. <laughs> um, and I, I took it out to 710 yards and made a first round hit. They're, they're incredibly accurate guns for the money. I have a review on the Savage Model 10. I most I I don't have that rifle sadly anymore because I had to buy car parts, but that's for a different story. Um, and so um, I ended up actually getting a Savage Mark II, which is 22 long rifle. Mm -hmm. I put a SWFA scope on one of those, and that thing is an absolute tack driver. Yeah, I've got a Mark II F, and I've got a scope on the top of it, and that thing is just awesome. I mean, other than the the expensive cost of the magazines, which ironically they call oh, them yeah. clip, they call them clips on the tag yeah. that comes on the gun. It includes two clips. Uh, they're like twenty bucks or maybe twenty five dollars. I'm oh, sure you can well, find better deals on them. But that, yeah. if if you think that's expensive, hold on, let me. Well, for a little teeny tiny something the size of a big lighter, I mean, it's yeah. almost ridiculous. That's, with that's gas the only things, that's you know? the only problem I have with Savage is they don't use any. They don't use like Accuracy International magazines. They don't use um, for like your 308s and stuff. They yeah. use their own proprietary stuff and it's so expensive. Yeah. Um, hold on. I'm actually going to show you the rifle that I'm uh, going to hopefully get soon. I just got to save up a little bit of money for it. So I'm trying to sell a few uh, of my rifles in order to buy this. While you're doing that, don't forget to don't rule out the Savage Axis series. Those are great rifles. Huh? They're, they're great. Uh, they're Mossberg, uh, Patriot, the Ruger American. Uh, Winchester is, is, has a few. I don't know much about Winchester bolt action rifles. I don't really follow them, but I know that they've got uh, some nicer models coming out. They've got a precision model they've recently released, too. All right. Uh, on Winchester, save your money and get us. Uh, Howa. Yeah. Yeah. Howas yeah. are very nice. How is Howas are great rifles <laughs> too. They still have expensive magazines. I have a I have a review on a Howa mini action. Uh it's the first thoughts I haven't uh actually gotten it out to do an accuracy testing yet. I, I went to the range with it and I shot it a little bit. I love it. It's a stupid fast little bolt action. Um and it's it's great for the money. I paid like six hundred bucks for it and it came with a scope. Now granted I ripped that off and put a 10 power SWFA on it, but here, here's pretty much the build that I'm going to be doing is it's going to be a 110, even though it's a 111, that it's a little bit of a typo on their website. Um, it's a 111 long range hunter and 338 Lapua Magnum, uh, five round, what looks to be an accuracy international mag. I don't know if they're interchangeable or not. So, I mean, this is cheap. This is cheap for a 338 Lapua Magnum. And yeah, that's going to get you into oh, long range. That's going to be. I mean, you. Oh yeah. Is that is that the least expensive three thirty at Lapua? Is there something that doesn't no. Savage make something in like the yeah, six Savage makes a cheaper range? one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Savage makes a way cheaper one that you could probably pick up for sub thousand uh, dollars. It's it's a single shot though. It's their. Uh, yep, here it is. It's their one twelve Magnum target. Now this thing is a beast. This thing is like fifteen pounds. It's. It's got a heavy weight uh, barrel. The older ones were fluted. The new ones are uh, just a solid barrel. Solid barrel, yeah. Uh, but this is MSRP, so you can probably get uh, around like nine hundred dollars for this. So if you want to go big bore, you want to go long distance. Maybe you want to go after that uh, moose or that bear. I'm just thinking about it. Some people want to do an Alaska hunt. You might yeah. be expecting to use that. There's a few books I've read on some of uh, Alaskan hunting guides. I've read a few books about them. The 338 Lapua tends to be their, their go-to for the large game animals. Yep, and if you want to get something super tactical, then you're <laughs> looking at you're looking at $2,100. There you go. So this yeah, again, is a, again, we're not saying you got to go buy a $1,300 rifle, but do definitely look at all of them. Take your time when you're looking for models. I like to go to gungenie.com, and I'll punch in the caliber I'm looking for, and that will bring up the whole list of rifles available on the, cali the caliber and then filter by price. 
Mm -hmm. that's a great way to just see what's out there and what you can spend. You know, Gelsma's got a good point. They got the Savage Axis series for 260 at Walmart, and some of those might even come with a scope too. So, mm -hmm. and here, but uh, here's the problem with this rifle. Uh huh. Brownells. That's how much one magazine is. How much is it? One hundred and thirteen dollars and ninety nine cents. Yeah. Well, if you can afford the rifle, you've probably got the money to shoot it. You probably got the money for the magazines. I mean, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's just like buying a like a sports car. You know, you can probably afford to maintain it. Yeah. Uh, Gelsma wanted me to ask you a question real quick, AWAG, while we're discussing this rifle. The muzzle brake that is ask AWAG about the muzzle brake that is super effective. He talked about it last night. This guy. Uh, let's see. Let's go back. I'm kind of bouncing between a bunch of tabs here. What do you got? Uh, I'm assuming the muzzle brake on the 110. Yeah. Good, bad. bad. What's that? Um, from what I've seen, it's it's very very efficient. Um, I've I've talked to people who have owned the the Magnum Target. I've talked to people who own the the one ten BA, and they say that it has the recoil of a three weight without a muzzle brake. Oh wow! Yeah, so there you go, guys. Definitely want to check out. Want to get yep. into. And but the, they're, those rifles are the heavier versions. So this one weighs, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Eight eight point eight five ounces. Uh, eight point eight five pounds. Ounces. <laughs> ounces. Yeah, have the thing just get launched into the stratosphere. <laughs> but um, twenty six inch barrel, fifty inch overall length. It's it's a huge rifle. That so, muzzle brake on the front of that thing, man, it looks like something I've seen on Barrett's before in 50 cals. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very cool. efficient. Oh, no. Actually, it looks more like an AMD 63 muzzle brake. <laughs> yeah. Kind of reminds me of it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's cool. So, again, when you're looking at the rifles, I want to make a couple suggestions to you guys on some oldies, but some goodies that I've had really good luck with. Uh, the first one, it's a pre-Freedom Group Remington 710. Now, there was a recall on the safeties that if you happen to buy one of these, I think anything made uh, before 2002, it did have a factory recall on the safety detent spring. So if you get one, here's the thing about the 710. Um, it was a very controversial rifle when it came out because in the late 90s, early 2000s, Remington wanted to release bolt action rifles and they wanted to beat everybody to the price point. It started using this thing called polymer in the trigger group and on certain components. And they, were off, they were able to offer you multi-caliber bolt action rifles for about hundred dollars below the 700s or the competition the Remington 700s. So 710, I had one in 243 for a couple of years. I actually traded just a just an FDE Ruger 1022 with nothing, just the just the rifle itself. Straight up, I traded it for a 710 with the scope. It actually came with the scope from the factory. 710 is awesome. You can pick these up for like 200 or 225 bucks. Uh, sometimes even less at pawn shops and online. Now, I know you can get that new Savage Axis for 260. You know, some people might not have access to one of those, but 710, I highly recommend it. It was it was very accurate. In 243, I was shooting a one-inch group at 100 yards. I have a few complaints about the trigger. I believe it's non-adjustable, and it is a little bit heavy. But if you want a good, you know, deer rifle or just a buddy rifle to have around if you're taking a friend with you or just something you can beat up, synthetic stock, blued, 710 is awesome. The other one to consider, and this one's been out of production for a while, if I'm not mistaken, the Mossberg 100 ATR. Like I said, that was the first uh, bolt-action deer rifle that I boxed. I didn't get into deer hunting until I moved out to where I live now. And the 100 ATRs, man, you can get them anywhere between 225 and 350, depending if you want used, new, synthetic stock, wood stock. That's a great rifle. That is an awesome one to check out. Look them up on Gunbroker. They're actually a really good deal. Uh, if you happen to see one pop up locally for sale, snag it. Great quality, build, construction, awesome. Now, I had in 30-06, and Tony is right. And Sandhills, I agree with you. I did get some scope bite off that, and it was a synthetic stock. Not pleasant to shoot, but I got it zeroed into where I wanted it and was able to use it for, for my, my deer hunts my first couple of years that I was hunting. So Mossberg 100 ATR. So if you want a couple of good suggestions for some entry-level, inexpensive bolt actions, that's the way to go. Once you start looking at the Ruger Americans, you're looking at probably around the $350 range to $400, depending on what you go with. My uh, Ruger American chambered in 762 by 39. I think I paid like 375 for it. A little, bit, little more than 400 out the door. Um, and then also you've got your, you know, you got the Mossberg, you got the MVPs. A lot of you guys are making more suggestions over in the chat on both sides on gun channels and YouTube. Uh, any, any models that you guys could suggest? Anything you recommend people go out and look into? Um, Sandhills, are you, have you shot the Browning yet or not? 
No, not yet. I'm still working on getting a scope on it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shoot it just looking down a bare barrel. Um, yeah, SWFA. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Hold on. I got you. One screen share. When we had our optics discussion, was that yes. last week or two weeks ago? Here you go. Get one of these. What am I looking at there? I just got in the car. I can't see very well. Oh, uh, okay. It's the, the SW, SWFA scopes that AWAG was talking about. Uh, last week was the last week we had the discussion on these? Yes. He highly recommends them. Now, you're looking at fixed power, right? Yes. So, Sandhills, what kind of range are you going to be looking at? What's your max Your max range you're going to be looking at with that rifle? Um, Probably less than what it's capable of, to be honest, just because of lack of long range experience on the shooter's part. Okay. And that that does go back to ethics. Um <clears throat> and I meant what I said to AWAG. I mean if if you have experience with long range shooting and you know that you can hit a given target at a given range and you've got enough energy, you know, delivered at that range then it's not unethical. But for me, it's not ethical to shoot much over three, three fifty to be honest. Just because yeah. I don't have experience shooting that far out. And so I I don't want to wound a deer. I'd, I'd much rather miss entirely than wound an animal. Um, so I don't, I just don't take that chance. I, I, uh, I'm confident, you know, within the 250 range, no problem with okay. my 243. And, and with the 270, I'm going to be able to, you know, do a little bit more shooting with it and get comfortable with it. And I'll push that out of ways. But I don't, I don't foresee me shooting, you know, I don't see me shooting out to 400. Yeah. Okay. Well, this this scope right here would be perfect for that because it's it's less power. It's a six power, and the reticle is nice and clear. It's it's got a nice little dot in the center so that you can basically zero it properly. Because sometimes if you have one that's uh, a reticle that's uh, a solid lines all the way across, is you can be off left or right or up and down uh, because your point of impact is ever so slightly like skewed by those uh, crosshairs. I've had it happen many times with my reticles uh, in other scopes like the Nikons and uh, Bushnells and stuff like that. But this, you can pretty much put your, your round exactly where you want it to go. It looks cool, cool. from what I can see from, from where I am. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not a bad price either. I mean, for three hundred dollars, you get something that will is is pretty much um, an old military contract rifle scope, uh, just slightly modified with less optical power than the fixed ten powers that were on the M twenty fours or um, I think they were the M forties or M twenty fours, one of the uh, Navy sniper rifles. Do you have my email address, AWAG? Can you email that to me? Um, I could throw a link into the chat, but I do not have your... AWAG, just send it to me and I'll forward it to him. It'll be no biggie. No problem. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool, cool. Uh, Tactical Merce, let's let's ask you a few questions. Do you have any experience with, uh, with deer hunting rifles or, or any hunting of game? No, I'm just listening in because, uh, I mean, I lived in Houston my whole life. I've been a city yeah. boy, so now moving to West Virginia, maybe I'll start uh, doing that. There you go, man. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just listening right now and just trying to uh, take in as much as I can. No, that's cool. That's cool. Like I said, just the, the thing to consider is, 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 you know, again, again, what do you want to hunt? What are you allowed to hunt with? And then how much can you spend? And then from there, you can start looking around because it is just, it's just like car shopping, guys. You got new, you got used, you got options, you have different trim levels, you've got different finish quality on them. You've got experience with the car or no experience with the car. It can be really fun, but it can also be very time consuming. And a lot of guys are very brand loyal. I'm not. If I get something that looks good and shoots well, I'm going to buy it. Um, some guys might buy a one bolt action rifle and that's all they have for life. And that works well for them, you know? Uh, Tony, could you make one recommendation for a caliber that would work well with large game all the way around in the USA? What would be 30 your choice six. of caliber? Odd six all the way? 308? All the way. It no. Because okay. odd six will let you use heavier bullets in 308. Okay. Okay. So if you're wanting to go a little further and be sure you put some down, the odd six is the better choice. Yeah. And you're going to be looking at a higher ammo cost, but does it really matter if you're just going to bench it one, once a year and zero it? 
and then take a box of 25 rounds with you out to the range or out to the out to the hunt, you know, because um, you are going to spend a little bit more on the ammo. But what's 10 bucks, right? When you're talking about better takedown power, better range in general. So you would suggest staying away from synthetic stocks for not six. Does that really matter? Uh, I would stay away from them because they freaking hurt. Okay. I use, I have two 30 out sixes right now. Both of them are Remington semi automatics that probably weigh seven and a half to eight pounds. Uh, and they're not bad to shoot. A uh, freaking ultralight hunter I had in 30 out six, the Savage 111. That's some bitch. I wouldn't, I, I, got, I got rid of it because I wouldn't shoot it. It hurt too much. Those automatic uh, sixes from Remington, is that kind of like uh, an automatic 12 gauge where the, the gas operation kind of helps tame some of the recoil just because of the way it's designed? Yep. Yeah, Brandy yeah. also has those too. You can get in a Winchester, I think they make the semi auto hunting rifle style uh, you know, deer calibers or big game caliber rifles. Well, Winchester makes one that's yeah. basically their logo on a bar the the new version mm -hmm. of the bar right yeah uh real quick guys on the youtube side jill's been saying that uh, odd six costs the same as 308 now that wasn't my experience when i went out and bought a couple boxes but it can be i mean i haven't priced 30 odd six in years so again don't let the ammo cost be a big deal whether it's the same price or not you know if it is the same price great if not you know it's it's up to you whatever you want to shoot not to mention, you could also uh, do your own loads at home too. You could also make your own your own reloading, and you uh, load, yourself, yeah, you can load thirty odd six from like a hundred grain bullet up to two fifty. Okay, uh, I don't like going that light with mine because the twist rate isn't quite right for it. But one hundred twenty five mm -hmm. grain works well. Gotcha. And, you know that's what I use here for varmint hunting. Cool, cool. Uh, 125 grain bullet doing about 3,200 feet per second, give or take a couple of hundred. Now, what kind of twist weight would you recommend for for that kind of bullet? Uh, you don't get much of a choice there. It's 1 in 10. Okay, 1 in 10. Okay. That's hey, Travis, I'm going go to I'm gonna go ahead and jump out. Thanks for okay. including me. I'll have a great Saturday. Hey, no problem, man. You too. Have a good one. I look forward to seeing your uh, your live chat. So make sure you guys check out Sandhill Shooter channel over on YouTube and, and YouTube and also on Gun Channels. He does a lot of uh, grumpy man chats. Uh, what, what do we call him again? What's what's the name of the chats? I just listen to him. Grumpy, grumpy old man. I'm grumpy usually old. bitching about one thing or another. Yeah, yeah. They're fun to listen, man. You do your live chats when you're when you're driving around and stuff, and they're they're cool. So do check out the channel. Yeah. And and it buffers a lot usually if I'm driving through hills and stuff so just bear with me i'll be back gotcha gotcha all right cool, all right, cool. Guys, later all right take care man all right we're going to go ahead and move into our second topic for today so hopefully we've given you some good ideas for for choosing the right kind of hunting rifle not just trying to focus on deer but things to keep in mind when you're looking for it going beyond just the way it looks in the in the gun in the in the showroom or in the case you know pay, paying attention to the quality or the caliber fit in the finish, you know, what's his intent and use, what's your effective range, all that fun stuff. Uh, do keep that in mind when you're out there looking. So moving on, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, pocket carry, yes or no. So something I want to show you guys here, many of you would never consider pocket carry, and you may like this or not like what I'm about to uh, to show you guys here. I know that uh, Never Enough Ammo, Matt, is a big, uh, big fan of this. Let's do a screen share here. If I were to pocket carry, which I usually don't, but if I were, um, I would consider going with one of these. This is the Guardian Kydex Trigger Guard. Now, I have no experience with these, but they make them for several different pistols. I know that Matt has one on one of his Ruger pocket pistols that he uses. Um, if I do ever have to grab something small, I know you guys can laugh me out of the chat here, but I do use a uh, Jimenez J22 if I just want something to throw in the, my pocket real quick to go walk the dog down the street. Um, I know it's kind of crazy, but that thing goes bang every single time I take it out. Loaded with uh, CCI mini mags if I had to defend my animal from another animal. Uh, I mean, I normally have my concealed carry piece with me, but I mean, that's the only thing I consider pocket carrying. And even then, I wouldn't pocket carry with one in the chamber just because it's such a crude pistol that it's got, I don't know, just the safety on it and stuff. I mean, it's fun to shoot at the range. There's a quick little gun to toss in the pocket, but I'm better off 
going for maybe a shield or going for, you know, one of the Ruger series and little pocket pistols. How do you guys feel about pocket carry? Would you or do you? Any thoughts on that? Tony? Too much shit in my pockets. Yeah, you know, the Kydex holster would be the same. The Kydex trigger guard would, would be the safe way to do it because you've got pins in your pocket or pocket knives or chapstick. You don't want something to get lodged in on that trigger. Even if you've got, say, a, a heavy double action closed hammer pistol, right? You'd, you'd want to be careful when you pull that thing out so it doesn't get caught on something. There's so many times you've heard stories, not to rag on ladies, but ladies that have a person there, a, a, a pistol in their purse. You know, it goes to the kid, grabs it, it goes off. The lady grabs it, it goes off on them because they don't have any kind of a holster around it. No sticky holster, no cover over the trigger. Um, like I said, I, I don't pocket carry unless I absolutely have to. But I think you could do it safely with the right choice in firearms. Um, well, I, yeah. When when uh, when I was in school, I mean, when I'm just, uh, I was pocket carrying the whole time because we were allowed to, we we're in Texas, they uh, recently, uh, about two years ago, said you're allowed to, to uh, conceal carry in school. So I, I, just, I just pocket carry an LCP and I used a uh, soft uh, pocket uh, holster that uh, formed to the pocket and everything. That's what I, I, I like that, the one that kind of fills the pocket so that you know exactly where your where your gun is. I mean, you, you know exactly where the handle is. With those Kydex uh, uh, trigger cover ones, I mean, I, doesn't it, wouldn't it move in your pocket and you just kind of would not know where the grip is sometimes? Like if you go for your gun, don't get a good purchase on the gun. I don't know, man. It looked like it was on like a Glock 19 size pistol. So mm -hmm. if you get it in your pocket, it ain't going nowhere. Right, but I mean, it'll it'll move in your pocket, and uh, you may have uh, like the it just in a different place than you than you expect it to be, and you're just kind of fiddling around for the for a good purchase on the gun. I mean, yeah, my, I that, 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 would be, that would be my biggest uh, concern with the it just you, it'll move in your pocket. And you don't get a good purchase on it with the ones that fill the pocket completely, like either Kydex or Soft. I mean. You know exactly where it is. You just put your hand in your pocket, and that's where it is. I mean, that's where the the grip is, and you got a good purchase on it. There's a lot uh, of suggestions. Oh, go ahead, continue, man. That's fine. I, no, uh, no, I'm done. Okay. I don't pocket carry because I don't particularly like it. I I don't oppose somebody else that pocket carries. I mean, that's fine if that's what you want to do. I don't have any problem with the appendage carry, so mm -hmm. uh, I do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, let's see a couple of suggestions popping up. Let's check. Let's check the uh, refresh the gun channel side over here and see if anybody's mentioned their their pocket carry options. Let's see. All right. LCP is good for pocket carry. Yeah, Patrick says uh, when I pocket carry, it's my Ruger LCP two three eighty with a spare mag. It's a good shooting little gun. Yeah. Uh, Paper plane crash says I pocket carry an NA mini twenty two with a folding grip. You can. I mean, those little suckers up close would be pretty vicious, especially with twenty two mag in it. Says other than that, I don't like the lack of ease and draw personally. Uh, over on the YouTube side, there's a lot of people chiming in with with what they do. Um, Moski says I carry a Smith and Wesson 642-38 special and a sticky holster in the pocket uh, so when I dress with the business casual. That's what I was looking for. It's probably like 648 or 649 uh, with that kind of still having the uh, the ability to uh, do double action, single action with the hammer, but have it kind of shrouded almost. Okay. Definitely. That's, what I'm, definitely. that's probably what I'm, I'm looking at next to buy if I was going to do pocket carry. Yeah. I had thought about pocket carry in my JA-22. You know, if I got to a place where I needed it, I just bought it inside the race board. I'll carry it. Uh, left side, appendix carry. Yeah, that, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, you, again, you can talk smack about it, but I take my JA-22 to the range many times, and it is... Dead nuts reliable until I hit about 150, 120 rounds. And then the uh, the carbon fouling starts to kick in and then it starts to have some issues. But if I'm shooting CCI mini mags through it, it is it is not a problem at all. So, I mean, it, it runs fine. I mean, I, I obviously don't have a lot of stopping power, takedown power, but it would work against little varmints or whatever. Uh, let's see, over on the YouTube side, Sean Pondry's disappointed. It's Hudson, I think it's what, the H9 doesn't fit in his pocket, brownie face. Uh, Philo does use the trigger guards. He says that they are great and very safe. Uh, let's see. Two Live Moose says I'm pocket carrying a 340 PD right now. Uh, Frank says Ky Kydex pocket holsters are better than trigger guards IMO. I uh, carry a C camp. Where'd that one go? A lot of you guys actually do this. I carry a C camp and a Don Hume. Can't go any bigger with the nature of my work. 
Uh, let's see. Sean says, outside the waistband, my jet fire and a pouch originally used for handcuffs. Hey, that would work. Uh, again, a lot of you guys have quite a few different options here. Uh, let's see. I carry my shield during the summer and shorts with cargo pockets. Works well, but the sites will wear holes in the shorts over time. There you go. Uh, carry, pocket carry a 938 with a board two pocket holster. A lot of good suggestions popping up over here. Uh, let's see. Fine Ape says, if you have a gun in your pocket, that's all you should have in your pocket. Dude, I, I completely agree with you. Same thing with me, too. Uh, let's see. Pocket carry a Smith & Wesson 438. I would agree with that one, too, and that's why I went to pocket carry. I already have too much stuff in my pocket. Oh, yeah. Uh, I what is this? I through that okay. KA-22 in my back pocket once. Okay. I didn't care for it, but it worked. Yeah. Again, anyone have any? Yeah, go ahead. Does anyone have any experience with those like kind of wallet holsters that like Yankee shows up or shows off on his channel and everything with those like C camps and everything? The wallet holster. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, are those like the sneaky peeps that you keep on the side of your belt, like outside the waistband? No, ones, or like oh. like something that that kind of forms to the gun and makes it look like a like a wallet that you put in your back pocket. I don't know if anybody has any experience with that. What kind yeah. of? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, there's guide gear and DeSantis makes them. They do have the trigger exposed. Yeah. Well, which, I mean, you know, yeah, you just, not, yeah. You just, you just want to have, don't want to have anything in your pocket, but I guess, yeah, I can see what your point is with that. Uh, it looks like, it almost looks like you could fire with it. If you, there's like a little holder, like looks like where you put a finger if you had to draw and fire it. Yeah. I don't know if they're functional. I mean, you might have a safety on. Uh, there's the Gould and Goodrich 702 wallet holster that's out there also. Yeah, there's a lot of wallet wallet style ones. I don't. I, I just it would be nice because it would definitely take away the any possible printing if that's a concern of yours. Although most people wouldn't expect you to have a gun on you anyway. But for ease of carry, yeah. I don't see anything wrong with those. I would maybe read up on them and watch some tests and make sure they are totally safe before you buy one. Yeah, I and didn't know they, anybody yeah. had any experience with those. I don't. Do you guys have any experience with those at all, Squib or Tony Away? No, I do not. Wall, like, no, no experience in carrying. Sadly. Okay. I don't have any experience with them, but when I carried that gun in my back pocket, it was extremely uncomfortable to have that bulge on both sides. Mm -hmm. I felt like you had a, a 1911 in your back pocket. Because, you know, most of the time I don't have anything in my back pocket. Here's a uh, picture I want to share with you guys real quick. This is uh, Frank Hellman just emailed this to me. Frank, I, uh, I've i had my email box closed because I had so many different windows open. But, uh, yeah, this is the – we got a Ruger going on here. And he's showing off yeah. this little Kydex holster. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of holster that I like, kind of the ones that kind of fill the pocket completely mm -hmm. so that it's, the gun's pointing straight up you know, and you know exactly where it is. Because I, I just feel like if you just had the, the Kydex just uh, as a trigger guard, yeah, I feel like it'll it'll move in your pocket and you're kind of digging yeah. around to find it. And I think this will be a quicker draw if you were going to pocket carry. Well, just the frame of that Kydex holster, the way it covers it up, it's going to it's gonna set it in your pocket so it stays upright. You've got this ridge along the bottom. Right. It's going to definitely help out with uh, with keeping it upright, which is the biggest thing. Because you don't want it going sideways or pointing back up at you. Right. right. That's that's my biggest concern with that other with that other uh, Kydex holster that just is a trigger guard. Now, me personally, I could care less, but maybe Frank could chime in on this. It looks like it forces the safety in the off position, which, in my opinion, is how it should be because it's already in a Kydex holster. But if you're somebody that cares about having that safety up, the way that it's molded around the safety button back there, it might not allow you to leave the safety on. Again, not a concern for me, but that's just something to to, to take into consideration. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very cool design. I've never, I don't, honestly, don't think I've seen a, a holster like that before. Partially because I don't really do much looking into uh, in a pocket carry itself. Uh, I was maybe going to see if he can tell me what model that is because I'm not familiar with it. That was uh, Frank Hellman posted that one. Let's see. I might show up here in a little bit. Uh, let's see if the gun can fire without removing it from the wallet. Is it in an AOW? Uh, I don't know. When it comes to those wallet holsters, there's been a discussion on that. I watched Yankee's video on it when he posted it a year or so ago, but then after that, just didn't really pay much attention to it. So, oh, okay, Frank says it covers the mag release. Okay. Uh, let's see here. See if we have any other. Any thoughts on a on any thoughts on a holster for a G2C? Yeah, Stephen. Um, 
when I had my PT111 G2 and I concealed that and the G2C is basically identical, I just went to Klinger holsters and got the Stingray holster. They have the Stingray, the Stingray 2. There's also Harry's holsters out there also. So you've got a lot of options for the G2C. Uh, it's a little chunky to carry, but you know, you can dress according to carry just about anything you want to. Um, so yeah, Steven, um, check out ClingerHolsters.com. I think they've got a Father's Day sale going on this weekend. Uh, really good company. I've bought several holsters from them. They take a little while to show up to get them, but they might have the G2Cs in stock because that's such a popular pistol right now. So, so now Frank says the brand is called a holster, a holster, a h o l s t e r. But other companies make them too. So Frank, that's good to know. That's something to look into. I really do like that option. That probably be one of the best ways that you could. It's a nice compromise between having a, a full cover Kydex holster and then just a trigger guard, which is which is pretty sweet. I like that. All right, so that's the ideas on pocket carry. All right, we're going to go ahead and shift over and move to our last topic, which we may or may not have any experience with it, which is fine. Um, we're going to talk about getting into shooting sports. Okay, so first of all, if you have a child and you have this available in your area, and I know Clover Tack is the expert on this, check out Clover Tack's channel. He's got a lot of videos and a weekly show on, on youth shooting sports. Uh, National 4-H shooting sports is definitely one to check out. Um, teaching kids respect for firearms, firearm safety, shooting bows and firearms and so on. Now I'm not, not part of this and I, and I wasn't part of this, but I've been kind of interested in it. The whole idea of you shooting sports, how do you get kids into shooting? And you know, there's nothing wrong with taking your kid to the range and showing them how to shoot and respect the firearm. But if you go to 4hshootingsports.org, all the information that you need right there is there. They also have information on it. If you want to be a trainer start the kids young, Start them off the right way, and uh, I think you can definitely, especially if they have a knack for shooting or they really enjoy it or they want to take it to a competitive level, this is a great way to get kids into shooting. Now, again, I don't have any children, but um, those of you that have kids, Tony, any, any, how, how would you get a kid into uh, into shooting sports? What would be your recommendation as a parent? I mean, say the, what, what would you say, Tony? What, what would work for you? Take them to the range, put a gun in their hand. And if they're really good at it, would you pursue, say, skeet or clay pigeon shooting or something long distance or target shooting? What At what point do you think you'd maybe push the kid into competition? I wouldn't. That's okay. their choice. If it's something that they enjoy, something that, they're, that, they, that they really want to do, you have a lot of options. Uh, yeah, that part of it is totally up to them. You know, I had all girls, so they really weren't that hip on shooting shotgun. Okay. okay. Gotcha. Uh, but the grandkids, I'm just taking them out and exposing them to different guns and letting them shoot what they like. Okay. Definitely start them up at a young age. Let them get comfortable with the firearm, respecting the firearm, and so on. Uh, Squib, what do you think, man? What What works for you with the kids? Well, first off, you know, as as a parent, you you want to. You want to teach your kids right from wrong and, and stuff like that. So I satisfied the curiosity about guns. You know, kids have this natural curiosity. They see them in movies. They see them in video games, comic books, TV shows, that sort of thing. They hear, if they, if they actually even listen to the news, they, they hear about them being used in, in crimes and whatnot. They have a curiosity about them. So satisfied the curiosity... You're going to take a lot right out of that. And then you're going to find out if the kid has uh, an interest, an aptitude. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, both of my sons really enjoy shooting. Enough so that they're even willing to clean their rifles after being at the range all day. No which is something kids don't. They, they, want, they, want the, they want the rewards. They don't want any consequences. So um, it is good family time. It satisfies their curiosity. And I did teach them respect for the firearms. What I did initially with them was I took them to a place where uh, I could just shoot whatever, however, uh, some private property, some family property. And I did a demonstration for uh, them, like what they did for us in boot camp in the Marine Corps, showing us the firepower of an M16. How deadly this little 223 round can be to a structure or a person. Now, it's not like what they say in the media where it'll take a jet out of the sky or that sort of thing, but exactly what sort of things stop it, what sort of things don't. Uh, a really good comparison, if you take a milk jug and fill it full of water and shoot it, that's what 
it'll do to a human head. Some people use a watermelon or uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, other large gourded fruit for that sort of thing. It, it'll, it'll, it'll let somebody know when they see the small hole in one side and the big hole out the other and the water just blast out, it'll, it'll help them visualize, okay, this is not a toy. So once you get past all that curiosity and the safety and the danger, and you're, you're certain that they're not going to be complacent or you're, you're fairly certain that they're not going to be complacent necessarily. They're going to pay attention and they're also not going to be afraid of this thing because you, you don't want them. I mean, they might jump a little bit with the, with the recoil or the, 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 the pop, that sort of thing. But once you get past all of that, then you can start honing the skills. Then you can start seeing what they like. You know, they're going to have um, they're going to have uh, uh, preferences like we all do. Uh, sometimes just based on the fact that they're smaller people, so they, they might just want a smaller, lighter rifle, but uh, as they get bigger, as they start growing, it's kind of like replacing their shoes. They keep getting bigger and bigger shoes. Well, they keep wanting bigger and bigger guns. <laughs> so sometimes the type of firearm they use can dictate uh, what, what sort of shooting they do. Uh, and then from there, my kids have not expressed an interest in wanting to get into any sort of shooting sports. But if they did, if they did, I'm at a level with them right now, having having been shooting, uh, having them shoot for uh, what I'm going to say, what five years now? Wow, um, that uh, that uh, if they wanted to do that, I would be willing to do that the same way we drive out every Saturday to do the flag football, uh, take them to some place to compete. Now, I would probably start looking at the local gun clubs. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of them in my area. Now, some of them have got some really ridiculous rules, and that right off the bat it just turns me away and say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not paying money for you to, to tell me I can and can't do this or I have to do this, have to do that. And other ones are fairly open, and, and you know, as, long as, as long as you contribute, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're really easy going. So it might require an hour drive or a 90-minute drive to get to a club that maybe is agreeable with me, but I would probably start looking at some of the local gun clubs for a, um, uh, a youth program or a youth competition program or youth training program or something that the kids could socialize with other kids that like guns, kind of like how we socialize. We're all grown men here and, and, and women sometimes uh, come on these shows uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and socialize. So they could get to hang out with other kids that like guns and they'd, they'd network out like we, but uh, on the same standpoint, they'd get to... Uh, they get to do sports. I mean, right now with this flag football, we've been doing this for years, and uh, it's it keeps going downhill. We're actually considering not uh, not signing up for the next session and not do. So we're we are actually right now looking for alternatives for our younger son. Uh, for what he you know do, does he want to get into tackle football? Does he want to get into martial arts? Maybe shooting sports might be it because um, my kids love to go shooting. So. This, this, it's in, interesting that this is a topic, and that's something we're actually discussing right now. I really want to chime in a little bit more fully than I did a minute ago with that flipping answer. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah. My uh, grandkids are now who I'm teaching. And with them, to start out with, I'd let them get on my lap and handle the guns that they wanted to look at. And as they're handling them, I was teaching them the, the safety rules. You know, you don't point it at anybody. You first check and be sure that it's not loaded. Uh, yeah. And this was all in steps. And this happened a couple of years before they went to the range the first time. Uh, there's also putting BB guns in their hands because you can shoot them right here at your house at a target and they're not going to hurt anything. Yeah. Uh, but once you take that fascination of the gun away then you don't have to worry near as much about kids and guns. I mean, imagine that responsible student, responsible students, responsible parents teaching their kids to respect firearms. I it's, mean, that, not hard, wow. it's not <laughs> hard to combine the cool factor that gets them, gets them in, right? Gets, yeah. them, gets them interested and the curiosity into here. Get it out of your system. Oh, that's it? Yep, that's it. Oh, okay. Then you get into the, don't be afraid, but if you do something wrong with this, 
This can kill you. This can hurt you. This could kill somebody else. This could hurt somebody else. And if you decide to be evil with this, which I have taught you right from wrong, so I don't know where you're getting the evil from, but if you decide to be evil with this, this will change your life forever. You will either, you know, be uh, killed during the commission of a crime or go to jail forever. This is something that the good guys use to keep, uh, to, to protect people. This is something the good guys use for recreation and sport and hunting and collecting and stuff. This is not, this could be used like anything else as a tool for evil but I am raising you right from wrong I'm not just teaching you the safety so you don't hurt or kill yourself or somebody else but also so uh, I'm showing you that this 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 is a choice like everything else in life you can choose to succeed you can choose to fail you can choose to do good you can choose to do bad this is just another thing in life you can you can choose to be responsible and enjoy this forever and pass it on to your kids and grandkids. And Tony, I'm looking forward to one day when I have grandkids and I can do the same thing. Or you can ruin your life with it right out the box and you're incarcerated forever and you're never, ever going to get to handle one of these again. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Another thing I would say is be patient with them because it takes a while for the, the safety rules to actually become second nature. And kids make mistakes quite frequently, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a situation where my older son, we were at the range, and we've got the... Little car going by there, I think. You know, somebody needs to go to Midas. <laughs> really? Really, dude? Trust him. Uh, at, least the plane, it, at least the planes aren't flying over right now. Yeah. So, uh, anyhow... Um, uh, we had a situation, we were at the range, I think it was the second time we went to the local DNR range, and they got the yellow line, everybody knows about the yellow line, you don't cross the yellow line until they say, commence fire, commence fire, okay to return to your station, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, my, my older son, we come back from target change, and we're waiting on some of the other people, and uh, my older son goes right over the yellow line to go grab something, it wasn't a gun or ammo or anything, I can't remember what he was going to grab from, from the shooting station. But uh, uh, he, I reached over, I grabbed him by the shoulder, and I pulled him back, and I go, you do not do that. Don't cross the yellow line. And after they, they called uh, commence fire and everybody got back in their positions, and, the, and we didn't have an argument. We didn't have a fight. He didn't give me a dirty look or anything. I think yeah. I startled him more than anything else. Range yeah. Master pulls me to the side, and he, he, he leans over, and he goes, hey, man, hey, I know what you were trying to do, but you're going to give him a negative opinion of coming to the range if you're like that he says i know what you're trying to do and yes we tell everybody don't do, you know because they'll, they'll get on the mic and they'll be like sir sir do not cross that yellow line step back you know that sort of thing and 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 i understood what he was trying to say and he's absolutely right when you're when you have a young person that you're mentoring and you're trying to uh show them how to be responsible and safe but also enjoy themselves and how much fun this can be you definitely don't want to have that negative. Neg so the patience is important. I mean, mm. when I'm out there and I've got the whole family, I don't get to enjoy shooting at all. I'm reloading magazines. I'm clearing malfunctions. I'm <laughs> answering questions. I'm adjusting slings. I'm, I mean, just you name it. I'm, I'm doing everything. And it's a, like a work day for me. But when I see everybody in the family is having fun and all that, it's worth it. It's absolutely yeah. worth it. So Tony is, is Tony is one hundred and ten percent right about the patience thing. It is, and he, you're right about the not shooting when you take the family to the range because I'm always with one of the kids, uh, depending on which kids I have out there, and I hardly shoot any uh, when I take the kids out. Yeah. Except um, except when they tell you their gun isn't working, and then you've got to shoot it to to test it to make sure that it works. Right, or show <laughs> them that it ain't going to hurt them. Uh, real quick, a little comment on the YouTube side. I just refreshed on the uh, the gun channel side over here. Uh, was it Philo, if I'm not mistaken? He had said, uh, gun clubs are a great way to start competing. Uh, professional circuits can have some huge barriers to entry. Club competitions will let you slide on equipment and won't DQ you at the drop of a hat. So I think that's good news for getting a kid into shooting or getting yourself into any kind of comp you know, competitive shooting. Uh, it's also important to take into consideration, you know, the ranges might have their own little local competitions, which is always a good way to, always a good way to, uh, to start. Um, so here's a question for you guys that have kids again. 
Uh, Stefan says, at what age should I start allowing, teaching, and showing my six-year-old daughter to, to shoot? When she was five? Yeah, I was about to say something similar. So yeah, Stefan, uh, go back and listen to what Tony said before about letting the child handle the firearm, get used to the fascination with the firearm, and then at some point down the road, moving to the range to let them actually shoot the firearm. So the yeah, sooner we, you can start, kids, you know, they're like little sponges when they're little. They will absorb things at a young age. Yeah. Here's the thing: you don't just, you don't just drag them out to the range. They've never, they've yeah. never seen any of this. They don't know what to do. And you just, you just throw that loaded gun in in their hand with the safety off and everything. And go have at it, kid. You know, when they're real little, you're yeah. holding it with them and you're explaining to them why the muzzles pointed down range and all this other stuff. And you put your hands around their hands and you kind of stand behind them and you, you show them how to the stance and, and they might be shaking a little bit, or whatever. And you just kind of talk to them calmly and, and you just, you get them through all that. And, 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 uh, you know, you put your finger over their finger and you try not to crush their little finger and, and you, you help them pull the trigger. Maybe it ain't a good idea to use a, a firearm that's too heavy, uh, something with too he uh, hard of a trigger pull, uh, something like not something with, you know, don't hand them a 44 Magnum or whatnot. God but man. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've, I've had a five year old with a 38 special and, and, you know, my hand wrapped around his hand and not, no problem, no problem at all. Um, you know, it's it's a matter of personal preference. Some people don't want their kids out there till they're 10. Some people don't want them out till they're 14. Some people start having their kids touch the firearms when they're three years old. Uh, it's it's everybody's different, and it's nobody's right and wrong. This is a parenting thing. This is this is like the one parent that will never let their kids walk to school, and the other parent that lets their kids start walking to school in second grade. I mean, it's just it's it, we all parent a little bit different. We all have different uh, reasons for what we do, and and uh, everybody's got to find the right thing. But yeah. the younger you get them into it, the more time they're going to have with it. The more time they're going to have with it, the better they're going to be. Um, I really wish that I had started as, as a kid. I didn't start till I was a teenager and I really missed out on a lot of stuff. I had had opportunities and had no idea that I, I, I did. And I don't want my kids to miss out on that. But I will say this, just be ready for the, the cost because it's going to start costing you an ammo and everything else. But um, <laughs> if my kid said, you know, dad, I'd really like to, I'd really like to go to a shooting match or I'd really like to get into something where I'm I'm doing this instead of instead of uh, some other athletics. Then, uh, along with going to the local club, I think I would look for the CMP, the Civilian Marksmanship Program. I think that would be something good for my my sons to get into. And that may not necessarily work out for somebody else because they may not have it available at their local club, or uh, you know their kids just may not be interested in doing a 500 yard shot with an M1 Garand, but. Uh, that 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 would probably be that probably be the direction I'd go. All right, I'm gonna make three points here, right quick. First off, as far as age go, it depends a lot on the kid. If they're mature enough to listen to you when you're explaining things to them at five, that's fine. If they're not until they're eight, that's just the difference in kids. Uh, secondly, put a gun in their hand. At fits them as well as possible. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, putting a little kid behind an adult-sized gun is just making it more difficult. And the most important freaking thing you can do is set it up to where they win. Uh, if you got to put them at five yards on the target so they can hit the thing, that's fine. Make sure that they can hit it. You've got to let them win. Otherwise, they're not going to want to do it. Yeah. Make yep, it he's, he's right it. there. And, you know, you, know, you, yeah. you once they get over that initial crack, 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 you know, that sort of thing, they realize the explosion is happening away from me. It's mm -hmm. not happening at me. It's a, it's going away from me. And and they once they get past that, and then, yeah, they hit the target a few times at close range, especially if it's a big target. And if you can do something like, you know, Hickok uses the two-liter bottles, and they spray out and stuff like that. I mean, you might get a little bit of high fructose corn syrup on your legs or whatnot, <laughs> but uh, that stuff is kind of, oh, this is cool. Yeah, you can do more than just shoot paper, oh, yeah. that sort of oh, thing. Yeah. There's there's all kinds of different, different things, but after a while, they'll get bigger. They'll get taller. Their arms will get longer. They'll be able to uh, carry something, hold something bigger, heavier. 
uh, they'll want, they'll, they will naturally want to gravitate towards uh, uh, something a little bit more adult, a little bit more. And then at that point, because they're already in that mindset where they want to improve themselves, at that point, you can start to say, all right, now you've got to be more accurate. Now you've got to shoot a smaller target or now you've got to shoot from further away or now you've got to do this or not. Or, or, I mean, like when I was teaching my kids how the different positions, we, uh, we almost always typically shoot offhand. But I was mm -hmm. showing them kneeling, setting, prone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, if, you, if you've ever shot in any of those positions, especially kneeling, or, or setting, if you've sat, if been in those positions for like six, eight, ten hours, your body really hurts. And I didn't put my kids in those positions for that long. There's the plane. What do you know? <laughs> I didn't put my kids in those positions, but I, but they started to say, oh, you know, this isn't very comfortable or this is kind of weird. It's like, try doing it in the California sun for 12 hours. You know, what? Yep, this is how I learned. So, uh, you know, the kids, if, if they decide that they want <laughs> If they, if they don't want this little little gun anymore, they want a bigger gun because they're getting bigger, they, it, it, it'll help you transition them into something a little bit more difficult. You know, you're a big boy now. <laughs> so, I know of several instances where the parent and the child argue over who gets to use the cricket. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you. I've had yeah, three yeah. different people tell me that. You know what's nice too like about everybody in the family having a gun is uh, when when I uh, built up these uh, or assembled uh, these AR-15s for uh, everybody for Christmas last year. I made them all individual. I made one this way for one kid, this way for one kid, this way for the wife, and this way for me. And I took mine out to the range and tested it, and it worked fine right out the get go. So I figured the other ones would be fine. The only thing is nobody wanted to go to the range in the cold. <laughs> we finally get a nice day, Mother's Day, and my wife says, for Mother's Day, I want to go shoot with my boys. And, all right, let's go. So we got all these AR-15s that have never been fired. Big mistake on my part. I should have test fired all of them. So the, the oldest uh, had a trigger problem. The youngest had a sight problem. And my wife just couldn't get the sling position right on hers. I'm, I'm, I'm running around trying to fix everything and deal with everything. And uh, the sight problem on, on my youngest sons, uh, I didn't, the front sight just would not go high enough. I've, I've since then fixed that problem, but I have not test fired it. Anyhow, he's, he can't hit anything with it because he, even though he thinks he's pointed at the target, he's not. And he's all bummed out because now he can't shoot his rifle. So my wife says, here, take my rifle. And she just sits back and I go over and I'm like, don't you want to shoot? And she goes, look at him. He's having so much fun. And it's like, it's fine. So having everybody in the family having a rifle or the parents bringing their, their rifles, especially I built hers to be really light. So it was no problem for him to, to, to hold it and shoot it. And he was just having a blast shooting mom's rifle because his was down. And, and uh, my older son decided, I'm going to go shoot further out, so bye. And he went down, and we, he's been shooting so long, I totally trust him. I'd go over and check on him every so often, and he's just like, could you bring me more ammo? So, I mean... It's it's uh, having everybody in the family with a firearm sometimes helps because now you've got a backup if one goes down at the range because kids are really bummed if their firearm breaks down and they can't shoot. Yeah. Oh no, I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, and then the next level to take them to once they develop this respect and this comfort with the firearm, check out. You know, when the kids go to school, um, I know that they're disappearing unfortunately, but a lot of your shooting clubs whether it's a skeet and trap club that you might have in high school or maybe a 4-H program, uh, you know, get them involved. They can go shooting with their friends and they can have a nice, nice organized club that they can shoot with, a competitive club they can shoot with. And then from there, you know, they could take it to the further level like college or professional. You know, every kid starts somewhere. And then from there, they just kind of move up the chain as to what they do. Um, again, no one is away from the top. I think, I think it's awesome that we're discussing the kids, you know, getting the kids comfortable with the firearms, getting them into shooting. Uh, you know, let those kids respect the firearm because from there they can develop maybe competitive attitude about shooting and they'll want to get into it, which is very cool. Uh, if you're going to get into shooting, and I'm just going to do a little bit of a screen share here, there's a lot of different options that you have. And, and a lot of the times it's going to depend on what's local. What does your range have to offer? Are they associated with any major organizations, whether it's an indoor range or an outdoor range, what's out there? So just do a, just do a basic Google search on competitive shooting. One of the first ones that pops up is the National Shooting Sports uh, Foundation, NSSF. And they talk about three-gun, which is pretty much the, the rage these days. It's what people are really into. 
you can find a lot of different three gun competitions at your local range. Uh, when it comes to three gun, there's two basic ruling bodies, the USPSA and the IMGA. And I'm sure there's a million other organizations out there that run their own three gun competitions. Uh, and in fact, a lot of ranges will just follow the rules of one of those two organizations and they will adapt three gun to fit the range abilities. So what, what, what resources the, the range has available. When you get into three gun, if you're looking at it, because again, this is one of the more popular shooting sports that a person might run into if they're searching around online, you've got your rifles, your shotguns, your pistols, your accessories. What's cool about it is that they've got a division for every shooter. Okay, you've got a lot of different options. Uh, you got limited, tactical, heavy metal, open, and outlaw open. Now, these are just a few of the, the regulated series out there. Uh, what's great is that if you just show up with a basic pump action shotgun, a, an AR-15, a holster, and a semi-automatic pistol and some mag pouches, you can basically compete. So do consider trying a three-gun competition or going and watching it. Uh, you know, when it comes to three gun, you can really start to invest a lot of money in your equipment, your firearms, uh, the cost of the matches, the ammunition. Um, I was hoping we could have Foose with us today because he does competitive shooting and he can just talk about the, the expense, you know, what it actually takes to get into it. It doesn't always have to be expensive. It depends on how many competitions you go to, but three gun is definitely one to consider, especially since many ranges can adapt it to work for them, which means it's going to be a pretty good option for something you can find. Um, other organizations that are out there, I've got a couple of them I want to share. We've got uh, IPSC or IPSC, I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, again, another competitive shooting organization that, that's out there that you can get into. If you guys have any experience with these organizations, let me know. Uh, you know, when you get into competitive shooting, it's definitely something you're going to be dedicated to. Uh, they deal with accuracy, power, speed. You know, each of these organizations has their own events. A lot of these uh, organizations are based around the world. So if you go to one of these events, you might get to meet people from other countries or other places. Uh, what's nice is that most of these organizations have a basic entry level uh, level of equipment you can use to get into it. So you don't have to go break, break, break the bank. You can shoot a lot of what you already have sitting around. And then again, that's um, IPSC.org. And I put the links for this earlier in the chat. And I also have it down below in the, in the description box. So we've got IPSC, which is out there. Okay, there's also IDPA, International Defense and Pistol Association. We were thinking that maybe um, Ghost, Trey, Ghost Tactical shoots in this league or this organization. Uh, again, a lot of these websites are awesome because they'll tell you where the clubs are. They'll help you find the matches, the countries, the dates, the official website. You know, you can join the organization, be part of it, and you can find out exactly what's out there. And you might be surprised your local range might host an IDPA event. Or maybe you want to go watch some of the larger events. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Well, now – before we get out of here, if yeah. you're a cowboy, there's also SAS. Oh, that's coming up. We got that coming up. I wanted to say that one for the end because that was one that we had a discussion on, and, and we did. You know, we've got a lot of details and information to set, to set up on that one too. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll get to SAS. SAS is pretty cool. Uh, IDPA is out there also, so do look into these organizations. Do you understand? You might be looking at a bit of a financial commitment, guns, ammo, but there might be somebody there at the range if you don't have. A shotgun that you can use for competition, you might be able to borrow one. Uh, hopefully, you'll have your pistol to take with you. Okay, we also have uh, USPSA.org is another organization to check out. And a lot of these supervise their own version of 3Gun. Uh, and again, they've got a great video that explains what USPSA is all about, what the events are about, what to expect if you go. Uh, there's a members area if you do join. So definitely one to, to check into. And uh, they've got a nice map where you can click on and they'll tell you where there are clubs available. So, uh, AY, we might have something in New Jersey for you. And uh, Tactical Mercy might have something for you in Virginia. So, there you go. Uh, so, USPSA is definitely out there. And then the last one that I wanted to mention was uh, SAS shooting. So, Tony, why don't you take it away? What can you tell us about SAS shooting? It is technically a shooting sport, although it's a whole different kind of idea. Tony, what do you know about this? Well, basically, it's three gun or cowboy mm -hmm. guns. Uh, except that it, you have to have more than three guns. You have to have four. Uh, yes. What they advertise is if you want to get into it, you can go and somebody will let you borrow stuff to start. It's rather expensive to get involved in. Because like I say, you need four guns at minimum. Uh, I can't tell you how many thousands I've spent trying to get into it uh, i am a sas member but 
I have yet to go to a match. Uh, I was going today, but my vehicle broke. Uh, as far as I, I really can't describe a freaking match because I've not been to one. I've watched some on TV or on yeah. YouTube, and it's frightening how fast these people can shoot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they were shooting single action, but they are so unbelievably accurate and quick. Um, the uh, the events themselves, a lot of the times they will, you'll do a historical recreation of a famous shootout. That's something that's part of some of the stages of some of the events you go to. Huge right. problem that goes along with it. Uh, but then, then Tony, why don't you talk about the uh, the attire, the costuming, the the character that you develop? What makes it? This is what makes it unique from, in my opinion, the other shooting organizations that we just discussed. Right. This is the actual center point of cowboy action shooting is the costume. Uh, you can go there and they'll let you try it out, but they will not let you there if you're not dressed at least somewhat cowboy. And that's another expense. I mean, putting costumes. Uh, by the time you get everything you need, you could spend a grand there. Yeah. Uh, so SAS is not cheap, and there's no money prizes. It's just com never competing for, for points and standings. Is that basically what it comes down to? Yep. Okay. Uh, I think you get a trophy, and you might get some prizes at some of the big events, but... Uh, now, there is side matches at SAS matches where you mm -hmm. can bet and stuff like that, but I've not been into that. I wanted to go to one today because they were having the Buffalo shoot. Uh, okay. Which is a 300-yard shoot. Oh, wow. Yeah. Iron sights with your lever action. Right. Yeah, I bought a gun specifically to do that with. Now, something I was just thinking about with regard to kids, but this would even apply to some adults too, especially if you're new to shooting or, or you just, you've only been doing one kind of shooting and, you, and you're really thinking about branching out, is the opportunity not just to watch one of these matches and see what's going on. You could spend a whole day watching any, any sort of competitive shooting and say, ooh, I'd like to try that. But a way that you could try it without actually having to participate, without having to pay the fee, sign up or whatnot. Like if there was uh, your local gun club had mm -hmm. a range that they use for IDPA or IPSC and they had, you know, a day where anybody could show up and they're going to, all right, this is how you do it. We're not scoring you. We're not judging. We're not, you don't have to do that. You should just go out there and stand behind this. Uh, when you hear the buzzer, pop two in, in center mass and then run over here, pop two in center, you know, that sort of thing, whatever it is. Yeah, there's one thing about seeing it, and that, that'll, that'll spark your interest. But then if you actually get to try it and go, oh, yeah, I'd like to do this. All right, at this point, now this here's your free one. Now, now you're going to be paying and filling out the paperwork and wearing whatever it is and buying the equipment and, and actually doing this. And I've heard people on YouTube say that with the competitive shooting, no matter what kind it is, that initially it's intimidating. I'm sure it'd probably be even more intimidating for a kid but it's intimidating and you go out there and you know, you're not necessarily going to win a trophy on the first time you're out there, but if you don't take that first step and do it, then you're never going to have the confidence to, to continue on. And I think for kids, that's a good way to teach them confidence. Uh, you know, that's just another positive thing about firearms. That's one of the cornerstones of SAS is their willingness for people to let other people use their equipment to, com to try it out. Uh, about everything you read about SAS says if you come to a match, they'll let you shoot. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they want to open the doors up to bring people in because not everybody's going to show up with an attire, with their Western attire on and their all the equipment that they need and all the ammo that they need. And, you know, again, most of us are pretty welcoming when it comes to meeting somebody at the range that wants to try the now, firearm. Or, yeah. Now, as far as outfits go, mm -hmm. it gets pretty simple. You know, some plain plaid, type shirt button down or snap or whatever a pair of jeans and a pair of like work boots if you don't have cowboy boots yeah something that doesn't lace up and uh, you can get in i mean when i say they want you in costume they want you to kind of look the part to be up there but you don't yeah. have to have the whole cowboy outfit to try it out yeah 
but cool. at the end of the day, SAS is freaking expensive. So, you know, I, I want to put that out there because I was stunned at how much I had to spend. Well, let's just say a lot of the shooting sports in general, you might have the guns, but the the travel expenses, the hotel costs, the food, which you can you can make that work in, on a budget. But you, but ammo. You know what, though? Yeah. All that stuff, though, if your kid is into sports yeah. and, and it requires traveling, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying all that. If your kid is into, like, uh, I've talked to other parents that have their kids into hockey, and they say that's one of the most expensive ones as far as equipment. And then yeah. I knew a guy, his daughter was in gymnastics. But they had to travel three states away for it. Uh, yeah. I've looked into kendo, and I got to tell you, all that equipment is expensive. And as your kid grows, you've got to get them, you know, larger and larger stuff. And uh, it's not something like football uh, where everybody does it, so you can rent it. It's something where you're going to have to buy it because it's, it's it, there's just not a whole lot of it. And and so the same thing would be with with the firearms. If if you're willing to spend the, that sort of money for sports. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is just another sport. It just depends. It, I mean, do you have the time? Do you have the money? Will your job allow you to, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to, to consider there. One thing yeah. that SAS has uh, for the kids is the fact that they have a separate shoot for Rimfire stuff, you know, 22 Rimfire, just for kids. That's pretty cool. That's something to look into. I don't know what the other organizations offer along that lines, but SAS does do that. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of options out there for you, whether you want to, whether it's something you'd like your, your children to try out or something you want to try out. There's quite a few different groups out there. And like I said, in the description box for this podcast, I've got the different links posted for you. I do need to post the post the uh, 4 H shooting sports link on there. That was something that I added at the very end because I thought, why not discuss the kids, right? You know, getting the kids into competitive shooting or yourself. So Also the possibility yeah. of scouts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is true. Um, let's talk to the young bucks that are in on the panel. So, so AWAG, starting off with you, uh, did your parents take you out shooting or what, what got you into shooting? What was it that kind of got you hooked on it? Well, oddly enough, um, I was 17 and I did not know that you could, at the time, I didn't even know that you could legally own, uh, firearms. So, uh, when... <laughs> When I turned 18, I was oh, I, last, I did a little more re I did some research on it, and I was like, "Oh, I can own guns, cool!" So I went out and filled out all the paperwork for New Jersey, and I didn't know the political situation at the time. I didn't really yeah. care. I just knew that, like, hey, I can buy a gun. It's cool. Um, so basically, I bought my first rifle, which is the 1947 Mosin M44. I had no clue how hard it would recoil. I wasn't worried about it. And oddly enough, my uncle took me shooting for the first time with that rifle. And I actually have that video on my YouTube channel. It's one of my first videos of me. So those reactions of me shooting the gun were super, super genuine. <laughs> um, I really absolutely did. loved it. So um, other than that, I mean, my parents got a range membership at a local range and... I just could not stop buying guns since. So, I really need to interject my offense here at the fact that you think us old guys didn't have parents. Oh, me? No, I just want to start off with the young guys because, you know, they're the younger ones that have only been shooting for so long. I'm just kind of curious as to how they got into it, especially now with kind of, in my opinion, you know, maybe maybe a lot, a lot younger parents not getting into guns or not getting into shooting just because of a whole liberal agenda push and stuff like that things we didn't have to deal with 30 years ago um you know i'm just kind of just kind of curious to see what how the young guys got into it you know just kind of seeing what what it was that got them into it oh we'll, we'll share we can share our opinions on, on or share our stories about how we got into it but i was kind of curious so all right okay and then uh te let's see texas Merce, what about you what do you think well i yeah uh, that was kind of the same story i didn't really start uh shooting until after college so around 18 19 years age uh that's when i bought my first gun which uh was the sd40 but yeah i d didn't know much about guns didn't know really anything and uh yeah I've just been collecting firearms ever since but kind of took a hiatus since i did school and everything but now that i have a job i'll start collecting them back up but yeah uh, i'm pretty new at, at all this so i'm learning good oh it's Again, it's never never too late to start, man. That's awesome. Especially, yeah. and you grew up you grew up in the Houston area. Is that right? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Houston. Whole time. So you know, 
you're a city kid, if you had the city your whole life, you know, you might not have easy access at a young age to maybe the, the outdoor ranges or ranges where you were old enough to shoot or parents that were into shooting or hunting. Right. You're just living your life, going to work, going to school, right? You know, you might not have access to those kinds of resources. Yeah, my, my so, parents weren't weren't too keen on shooting guns and everything. So Okay. okay. Yeah. That's all right. Cool. All right. Well, it's good to know. Uh, Tony, what about you, man? What got you into shooting and guns? You know, I can't tell you. I don't know. I've been around guns my whole life. Uh, uh, any family involvement at all? Any hunting trips with the parents or the my, grandparents or anything? What's up? All of my family. Everybody was into guns. Uh, went hunting quite a bit when we was little. Mm -hmm. uh, just because they didn't have babysitters for us, so they'd take us. Uh, it's just been the way of life my whole damn life. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember a single specific thing that got me into guns uh, at all. I've always been into it. Cool. But in the 60s and 70s, it was a different freaking world. I mean, everybody pretty much in this area has always been pro-gun heavily. And the same place where I lived down in Missouri. I mean, everybody had guns. Was it the environment and the times or the need to feel like you would need to protect yourself because of rioting and just oh, how people were? Or what? Just Guns were just another thing you had. Yeah. Just another tool. Another tool in the toolbox, right? I mean, it was no big there, deal. There was... You know, no thought of self-protection or anything like that. You've got a gun to go hunt with or go shoot with. What about, like, uh, open carry in your state? When you were growing up, was that something that anybody could do? There was no permit needed? There was no permission I once honestly, you reached any clue? I don't think that open carry was allowed in either state when I lived in them. Okay. But I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember ever seeing anybody other than cops open carrying. Yeah. And, you know, it depends on the state. It depends on state law at the time. It depends on what, what was allowed and what wasn't allowed in the area that you grew up in. People weren't near as paranoid about shit back then. Yeah. No, it was a different kind of mindset, different kind of attitude about how we treated each other and how kids were raised and what kind of morals people had. And, you know, and I'm starting to sound like an old guy, but that's just kind of my opinion. You let your kids play outside all day with no supervision or yeah, doors, are locked. doors at night. Yeah. When I was in grade school, Tony, we get to we would get to ride on our bikes and go home for lunch. You could drive all the way across town to go home for lunch if you wanted to. We had like 45 minutes for, for lunch. So I used to get on my bike. This was grade school. Fourth, fifth grade, third grade, get on my bicycle, ride home, have lunch, ride back, show back up at recess time, or go out. We go to the taco shack across the street from the school and go eat there. You know, you could do things like that. There was never any concern, never any problems. Uh, or if there was, it was pretty rare when you hear about things, you know? Basically, when... By the time I was like 11, uh, I could, if I wasn't at school, I could be gone all day. I just had to be home by dark. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I didn't have to check in with where I was. And, hell, we would ride all over Perry County, Missouri. <laughs> it's a lot of hills, man. It's a lot of hills. It's uphill, uphills both ways, right, in, uh, in Missouri? Uh it's a pretty rugged country, wasn't it? Where you were at, lots of forests and stuff. Man, at 10, 11 years old, I didn't really notice that much about hills. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it just was what it was. You rode the word swimming hole was most of the time. Yeah. Stayed yes, there all true. day and tried to race home before dark. <laughs> Heck yeah. Hey, uh, Squibby, what about you, man? What were your experiences growing up with firearms? What were your first kind of interactions with it? Or did you ever do any competitions as a kid growing up? Or, Well, I didn't uh, I didn't grow up with guns in the house. You grew up with Taco uh, Bell? <laughs> yeah, I grew up with Taco Bell. I, uh, the, now everybody's hungry. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, no, I, I did not grow up with, with guns in the house. I grew up, I, I started buying books, reading about guns. I was very curious about guns. I was really, my, my family wasn't anti-gun. Uh, it was nothing like that. Um, it was just, we just didn't, didn't have them. And, and it's kind of a shame because my dad is a really good shot. 
and it would have been cool if he would have taken me and my brothers out shooting, but so be it. I made my own life, and I decided that I wanted I wanted to, to get into this stuff as an adult, and, and uh, on my own, I did. The first time I did shoot a gun, uh, I was 16. My dad took me squirrel hunting. He gave me a loaded 22, and the first time I pulled the trigger, I almost killed him. Uh, it's kind of sobering. Uh, yeah, need yeah. to say he was pretty PO'd. Uh, there was no safety lesson. There was no this, and I had to actually taken hunter safety uh, in sixth grade uh, in Georgia, and uh, but they weren't allowed to bring any guns into the classroom. So all the guy could do was talk about it. Well, that's great about talking about it, but I'm a very visual kind of touchy feely. I can read a manual all day long, but if I don't have the item in front of me to go, oh, okay, that's what this means. I don't, I don't connect the two. So even though I knew a little bit of firearm safety, there was no, and, and I'm not, and, and, and I'm not trying to criticize my dad on air or anything like that. It was just, this is, this is, you know, he, he grew up a country boy down in Kentucky and, you know, I mean, uh, that's probably how he learned. I don't know. I never asked him, but, um, uh, it was, it was more the military that got me, uh, more knowledge on firearms and firearm safety and, and, and then, you know, the, the MOS I did, I, I did a lot of repair work on, on uh, firearms and things like that. So uh, it, was, uh, it, it was that, that that just pushed it even further. But really, um, when, when you're talking about this, what, what got me thinking was, um, for you young guys out there who don't have families yet, understand this. You have a lot of fun researching your firearm finding it, acquiring it, accessorizing it, shooting it, and then you're on to the next one, and you're on to the next one. And before you know it, you've got a big collection built up. But understand this, that as much fun as that is and as much money as that costs you, once you have kids of your own, it's really going to cost you. Because if you want to get the kids into this, and you don't have to force them. Like Tony was saying, you got to find out if the kid's got, uh, you know, uh, if, if the kid's even interested. But if they do show an interest... As a father, as a parent, you're going to want to nurture that interest, especially when you see the look on their face, you know, the first time they shoot and hit the target or, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to be like dad or whatever it is. It's just a whole different thing. And until you experience it, until you experience it, you just, it's, it's really hard to convey that emotion. But at that point, you're, you're not buying one rifle. You're going into the store and you're buying four. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you're not reloading for just you. You're reloading the caliber that your son likes because it's expensive. 7.62 by 25 Tokarev, really. So, uh, you know, you're, 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 um, you're, you're doing all this stuff. You're spending your time and your money, not just on your, your passion, but now you're doing it for your kids. And your kids may not realize that. They may not even realize it until they have kids and they start doing it for their kids. And then one day, maybe they're having a beer with you and they're going, Dad, I never realized how much this stuff costs until, you know, yeah. until I started, you know, paying for the whole family too or whatever. But, but the whole thing is, though, for you young guys, understand that um, it, 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 it can be a labor of, of love when you start getting the whole family involved. And you may, you, if, if you guys aren't married and you're, you're, you, you know, you're still trying to look for Mrs. Wright to settle down and have a family with, you may meet a girl that is the girl of your dreams, but she's absolutely terrified of guns or she is absolutely anti-gun or whatnot. And she may say, I don't ever, you know, you find, have them in the house, but I have them locked up. I don't ever want to see them, blah, 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 blah. Once you have kids, if the kids are going, dad, I want to, I want to learn how to shoot. And she sees that she may suddenly go, Hey, maybe this isn't a bad thing. And the next thing you know, you've got the whole family doing it as a family thing. And when you're, when you're all doing something together as a family, it's kind of like taking that family vacation or anything else. There's lots of memories built. There's lots of bonding. Mm -hmm. and, and there's even time to talk about stuff. And, and, when, and, and when your kids get older, they don't want to have nothing to do with you. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to this. They don't want to that. So if you're ever doing something as a family where you've got the kids' attention and, and they, they learn to respect you and, and maybe even try to understand you a little bit more, understand where you're coming from when you're, when you're trying to teach them right from wrong and, mm -hmm. and values and things like that. Uh, it, it, really, it really is beneficial. I mean, I don't think people out there who don't understand guns, they don't understand 
all of the positives. I, I am of the firm belief there are more positive things that come out of guns and shooting sports and the 2A community and all of that than there are negative things. As much mm -hmm. as the media wants to push all the evil and negative things, there are so many good things that can come out of this. So just if, if you guys have kids one day, just, you know, uh, you don't have to force them. They're either going to or they're not. But you may end up finding out the whole family wants to do it, and it really is a special thing when it happens. There you go. Just lots of good advice here, man. A lot of stuff to take into consideration, especially those of you that are getting ready to settle down or, like you said, looking around. Uh, just keep all that in mind when you get there. It's definitely the way to do it, man. Now, don't sell that 22 that you don't like anymore because one day your son may want it or your daughter you or your daughter. Yep, yeah. yeah, exactly. I, Tony, I what's guess. Off? I was surprised about my granddaughter because she was a girly girl <laughs> and still is, except for guns. Uh, she is totally into guns and shooting, and she's all of six. That is pretty cool, though. They just kind of uh, just they enjoy it. They really get into it. They start to get good at it. They're only going to get better as time goes on. So that yeah, is, my, yeah. My grandsons, actually, two of them are really good scary good uh, with that very little instruction i mean yeah that, other than the safety stuff yeah and tell them you look through this hole and you put that side in the middle on the target and there you go very cool very cool all right, guys. Well, um, I think we're probably going to go ahead and call it. We've been going for almost two hours. We started right at 8 o'clock. Again, had a good discussion on the hunting rifles, uh, what to do if you're looking for one, stuff to take into consideration. A lot of experience on the panel today. And I want to thank anybody that joined in on the panel that's now gone. Uh, then we talked about pocket carry, should you, yes or no. Okay, if you're considering it, definitely listen to that portion or re-listen to that portion of the discussion because we'll talk about the pros and cons of the different kinds of carry. And then finally, getting kids into shooting, competitive shooting. Getting into competitive shooting yourself as an adult, what are the options, what's out there? A lot of resources out there for you that you can use. And again, the, the links are down in the description box on this video. Uh, so if you're looking for something to get into or you just want to just check out a competitive shooting match, generally you tend to find most of these places to be very welcome and open open because they want to, you know, they're always looking for new members, something to take into consideration. So a lot of options out there for you. So panel, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, real quick, let's see who's over on the gun channel side. We do have Patrick hanging out over there. We've got Paper Plane Crash over there also. You guys joined in. Thank you for watching on the Gun Channel side. Uh, over on the YouTube side, we had Moobud hanging with us, Midnight Range. Jelsma was with us for a while. Uh, Philo, David Bowling, uh, Outlaws, just joining us a little bit late, but he's out there too. Uh, Stephen Dawkins, uh, Philo, 2Live Moo, uh, Mad Sexy was with us for a while. Uh, Armament Axis, Ghost Tactical showed up for a while too. Welcome, buddy. Uh, Rob D., Sean Pondery out there also. We had uh, Frank Hellman with us. Uh, I don't want to miss anybody. 651 Gunny was with us too. Uh, Charles White and Rich White. Uh-oh, there's some competition there. Uh, Night Wolf was with us today too. And I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody here. Uh, we had E-Rock with us. Rob D. Uh, Fiddle Newbie, Trigger Tickler. Again, like we like to say, uh, the usual suspects were with us. Midnight Range TM, chilling out with us. Uh, Fine Ape was with us too. So again, just bringing our, our opinions and our experience with you every week. Different topics out there for you to check out. Uh, we should have an episode next uh, Saturday. I believe that we're coming up on Father's Day, so I know some of you might be busy. Uh, so, But in the meantime, I'll definitely have that episode posted as soon as I can so you get the alerts. Make sure you click on the bell so you get the alert when we go live so you don't miss any of the episode. If you did miss it today, go back and listen to it. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, any final parting words of wisdom or anything you want to share or plug before we go? Tony, what do you want to say, man? Yeah. Uh, make it fun for the kids. Mm. That's the important thing. Uh, and check me out weekdays, mornings on the early watch. Uh, time is probably going to be 6 a.m. Eastern. Or wait a minute. No, 8 a.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. 7 o'clock Central. 7 Central, 6 yeah. Mountain, 5 Pacific. Yeah. Uh, cool. We're trying to do a show every morning, weekdays, and other than that, good day, everybody. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, man, make the shooting fun for kids. There's so many times where parents get so competitive and they're, what do you want to say, vicariously living out their past through their children when it comes to competitive sports. Let the kids just go out there and have fun. 
I mean, that's something that we're just so serious about anymore. I mean, it's just ridiculous, but let them enjoy it. You know, let them have a good time with it and then they'll develop the skills and they'll want to do it and they'll have a better appreciation for the sport and they won't disappoint you later on in life either. So, all right, uh, let's see, Texas Merce, any final parting words, buddy? Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, just to go off of what uh, Squib was saying, I introduced my uh, my wife to shooting, and now she's a she's a better shot than me. So. Oh man, so. I don't know what it is about the ladies, man. I think I think they're more patient with the targets than we are. They're, they're I my wife is the same way, man. She's she's a lefty, but she's still awesome. So well, I think I think uh, I think I took on some bad habits that I had to uh, work through, and she didn't develop those bad habits, so that's why she's better than me. It's, uh, too many action movies <laughs> growing up, man. Too many too many exactly. action movies as a kid. So yeah, exactly. All right. Well, no, thank you for having me again. Every week. What's that? Women said, Thanks are naturally for having me better again. shots. Tony, I oh, go ahead, Tony. Women are naturally better shots than men. Why that is, is that, correct. Tony? Lot, lot more patience with the shooting, or just more attention to detail, or what? They're more detail oriented. Yeah, a little more patient with what they're doing, possibly. Uh, I can see that. Drive, beat their <laughs> husband. Yeah, there you go. This natural competitive ability to say, you know, told you so, right? Right. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, hey, I appreciate you joining in. Good luck with the move. Hope everything goes well. Uh, maybe see you next Saturday. We'll see how the move's going. I don't know. You might be doing some decorating or setting up your new man cave. So I get it if you're not with us, but if you can. It's always cool to have you join us. So thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. Good stuff. All right. Uh, Squibby, any parting words of wisdom? Uh... No, just uh, thanks for the invite to the show. Uh, enjoy doing it as usual, and uh, really good good topics today as usual. Cool. And uh, cool. just thanks for letting me drone on. No problem, buddy. Hey, uh, you know topics or viewer requests that are still coming off an Instagram post that I did a month or two ago. Got plenty of topics that are still left over, so we'll just have something different. Maybe do two or three topics. At some point, we'll probably go back to focusing on one topic because we can talk forever on certain topics, but. Um, yeah, you guys, if you're new to the series, make sure you check out the past episodes, Caliber Corner. Um, I've been posting them over on guntube.org. Uh, if you want to see the newest episodes, make sure you go over to gunchannels.com, get yourself signed up. And uh, I got the channel over there too. So, yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on here every week. Good stuff, man. All right. And uh, last but not least, AWAG, anything you want to talk about or mention before we call it? Um, other than. Keep posted uh, on my channel. Hopefully, if I do end up getting this 338 Lapua Magnum rifle, I will be doing a very, very, um, uh, how do you say it? Uh, just interesting review of it. Cool. No, that'll be awesome, man. It'll be good to get you getting some. And now that you got your new computer, you've got the processing power to make some fun videos and good videos. Yes. And that's awesome, dude. Uh, let's see here. See, anything's popping up in the comments over there. Everybody's just getting ready to go eat their first breakfast or second breakfast. Real quick, I want to mention this before we go. Um, Atypical Jake reached out to me. He's a fellow YouTuber. He watches a lot of our videos and comments on him. I'm uh, borrowing a P PS90 for a week or so. And uh, Jake is now making a tactical rail right up here in the front. And it bolts onto the frame of the rifle. And so if you're somebody that has a P90 or a PS90, he makes uh, two different versions of the, front of the uh, rail. He makes a shorter one too, so you can mount a tactical light or a laser on the front of it. Um, he's going to be selling these soon, and I'll be putting a video out on YouTube about it. Uh, I'm not showing you how to install it, but just showing it before and after and talking about the product. So if you're interested in one of those, um, I will have the contact information in that video, and he's just getting ready to start producing them. There's no inexpensive way to mount a laser or a light on a PS90. So he got innovative and decided to start making his own rails, which I think is very cool because you are it, it, you'd be blown away by how expensive accessories for the PS90 are because there's just not a lot of companies that make gear for it. So if you're interested in one of those, be watching for the video on my channel, Travis P11. It'll be showing up uh, next week. I'll get that video out there. And uh, I will be taking this to the range, but I won't have any accessories on the front of it because I don't have a laser or light that I can mount on it. Um, he, does, he did design the, the SBR version of the rail for a very specific Crimson Trace laser that fits, that, that works well. And so that's going to be on there too. Uh, that, that's going to be on, he's got an install video on that, that that talks about it. So if you're interested, just something out there, just want to give a plug for that guy because he's just getting this started right now and he's excited. And uh, I'm looking forward to testing it out. So, all right. In the meantime, guys, this has been Caliber Corner episode number 46. I want to thank you guys all for watching, for staying with us the whole time. Go back and rewatch it if there's any parts that you miss. Uh, you people chatting over on the YouTube and Gun Channel side, you guys are awesome. Thanks for joining us. And panel, I want to thank you guys for joining us. And in the meantime, 
Guys, have fun. Be safe. And as always, we will talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.